Once a year, the sun rises over the grounds of the Inn at St. John's to welcome not tee shots, but drives of a far different sort. Hundreds of rare and classic automobiles roll in and line up for the Concord d'Elegance of America, one of the world's finest gatherings of what are truly magnificent machines. Welcome to Top Coach Magnificent Machines, coming to you from Concord Elegance of America in Plymouth, Michigan. I'm Bill Stevens, and I'm sitting in a 1910 Stoddard Dayton limousine, a car that was built in Dayton, Ohio, between 1905 and 1912. And as you can see, this was a pretty upscale ride. You can see the beautiful polished paint and all of this brass work, but the thing I love about this car, it's got a Hemi! A 50 horsepower, four cylinder, hemispherical combustion engine that would get it up to about 40 miles an hour. It's a fabulous car and just the first of many that we're going to see this half hour. When you mention the name Rolls Royce to the younger generation, they probably picture rappers cruising South Beach on a Saturday night. However, the history of the Rolls Royce goes back over 100 years. This is a 1920 Rolls Royce Silver Ghost owned by Simon White. What a history on this car. She's quite a rare car. She has quite a history. She's a, a British Silver Ghost, and she's one of the famous three that came over and was used to uh, replicate for the Rolls Royce Springfield. And this Rolls has had several different bodies on it over the years. This is her fourth body. The first body was a, a sedan, um, then it went to a Tora, and then I believe it went to an FR Woods Landlet body. And then today you see uh, the torpedo body. Tell us about this little mini display on the ground next to the car. This is exactly what you would have gotten from the factory when you, when you took delivery. I'm told if you want to buy one complete, it's $17,000. Um, thank heavens for eBay, because it didn't come with a kit. Now this is the gold standard, a 1929 Duesenberg Model J sedan with coachwork by Bowman and Schwartz. It's like a giant Christmas ornament. And look at this, it's won a gold ribbon. And there's another award-winning Duesenberg parked not far from here. Well, if Rob and Jeannie Hilaritis look like they're very proud, I can tell you why. They own this 1933 Duesenberg SJ Convertible Burline with body by Murphy. That's a long name, Rob. Can you kind of explain what each one of those terms mean? Duesenberg didn't build their own bodies. All bodies were coach built. This one happens to be built by Murphy in Pasadena, California. Convertible Berline is uh, different than a convertible sedan in that it has a divider window. The Duesenberg brothers uh, were self-taught engineers. When E.L. Cord came in, he wanted to build the best of everything car, and he kind of gave them a, uh, a clean slate to do so. And he wanted the most expensive car. What would a car like this sell for back in 1933? Oh, anywhere from uh, 12 to 20,000, depending on the coach work. Which in today's money would be astronomically higher. Yeah, I'm not a mathematician, but it'd be more, I promise you. There is an exceptional selection of Cords, Auburns, and Duesenbergs here at the Concord d'Elegance of America, like this 1936 Auburn Boat Tail Speedster. It's the 852, and back in the day, movie stars like Clark Gable and Jimmy Cagney and Betty Grable were driving around Hollywood in cars like this. Now, when you say the word Cord, it's probably a model that comes immediately to mind, and we took a look at one of them. Even though the Cord automobile was not built for many years, it left an indelible print in the automotive world. This 1937 Cord 812 SC Cabriolet is owned by this man, Dennis Carlson. And it's quite a story about what you found out about this car after you bought it. Well, I purchased it at auction, 
and it said it came from a California collection. And all of a sudden the title shows up and it came from the Peterson Museum. And then I later found that Robert Peterson took it to Pebble Beach, and I think it was 2002, and won the second highest award there. So that was sort of a surprise that came in the bucket. It told me a remarkable thing about the paint job on this car. The, the paint, uh, I do as a hobby a lot of car restoration work. And this thing came, and it turned out it was acrylic enamel, and I would have never on earth. But the paint job is 30 years old. It turns out acrylic enamel is incredibly tough, terribly hard to buff up to bring to a shine, but when you do 30 years, this thing looks like it was painted last month. REO, are you familiar with that term? Well, in automotive history, it refers to a gentleman who was quite a pioneer, Ransom E. Olds. Yeah, now it's getting to be familiar. Well, Frank Bahazier owns this 1931 Rio Royale Victoria by Murray. And what do all those words mean there, Frank? Ransom Eli Olds did start Oldsmobile, which was the first car company, he eventually bought by General Motors, and eventually once he left the car company, uh, started his own, uh, obviously using his uh, initials for the car company itself. Rio would produce the chassis with the engine, and once you would take it to Murray, um, again, sky's the limit on what your options would be. You know, when you talk about Cadillac, uh, Packards, Duesenbergs, you know, Auburns and Cords, Rio is in that category. It's not, it's that car company that talked about, but not often seen. Um, but, you know, when you do see one, it is a pleasure. Coming up next on Top Coat's Magnificent Machines, Concord USA goes Italian with a roster full of rarities. We'll be back in a moment. Top Coat's Magnificent Machines is brought to you by rockauto.com. All the parts your car will ever need. Borla, the world's most winning exhaust. And by Top Coat. Don't just coat it, top coat it. Welcome back to Top Coat's Magnificent Machines and the Concorde Delegance of America. Ferrari is the featured mark this year at the Concorde Delegance of America here in Plymouth, Michigan. You're gonna see just about every single iteration of great Ferrari road car here, including this 1954 Ferrari Mille Miglia Berlinetta by Pininfarina. When this car was restored, curiously enough, they consulted Chuck Jordan, one of the styling chiefs at General Motors at the time, to make sure that they got the color red right. And speaking of GM and Ferraris, wait till you see this next one. All right, work with me here. If you drive a Corvette, this man's name may be familiar. For 35 years, he was the engineering manager at GM on the Corvette project. However, Tom Hill, he's now the caretaker for this 1967 Ferrari Nart Spider. What a history on this car. Uh, this is a great car, yes. They, they, they built 10 of these cars. They realized the American customers like open top cars, or spiders, as the, the Italians would refer to them. So they commissioned 25 of these cars to be built. Uh, this was the ninth of actually only 10 cars that got built. And the reason there were only 10 cars is they were too expensive. The 275, when they came out, was the first time Ferrari built a car with a transaxle. So they moved the transmission to the trunk, if you would. That transaxle changed everything for Ferrari, and they basically have done that ever since. What do you think a car like this might be worth today, if you want to give us just a range? Well. We would probably not cash your check for $30 million. $30 million. Got a little bit more Italian cooking for you. This 1946 Fiat 1100C Spider by Carrozzeria Frua. That's a mouthful, but this is one of one, the only one in the world. And this car has been winning awards ever since it made its debut back in Italy, back in 1946. In fact, it won an award right here this weekend. Well, you may be surprised to know that this is a Hudson. Not just any Hudson, this is a 1955 Hudson Italia. And Bruce Grenager is here with me and the car. And tell us about the styling of this car. Where did this come from? Well, Hudson wanted a halo car. So they sent Hudson jets over to Carrozzeria in Italy, in Milan, 
and said, do something special with it, and obviously they did. They just took the old jet body off, that went in the scrap, and they built this, and obviously it attracts attention, which is exactly what they wanted to do. Exactly. However, they didn't build many of these, did they? They built 25. 25, and uh, any idea how many of these may be left in the whole world? 20, they believe. What led to the demise of this car? The demise came because this was shortly before Hudson merged with Nash, and Nash didn't like it, so that was pretty much the end. This is a 1911 Stanley Steamer, and back in those days, some manufacturers thought that steam-powered cars would be the wave of the future, but it didn't work out that way. Let's set the clock ahead to 1963. The Chrysler turbine car, again, a unique power plant that Chrysler thought may be the way cars would be built heading into the future. And Brant Rosenbush is with FCA who owns the car, and things didn't turn out the way they thought, did they? No, it really didn't uh, come to fruition at the end of the project. And what ultimately led to the demise of the turbine car? Well, again, it, it just didn't have the efficiency. Um, it, the mileage was no better than a standard engine. But the problem was really the cost to manufacture the engine. Uh, this engine, I heard, is about thirty-five to $50,000 in 1963 for one engine. So it, it just cost prohibitive. Out of those 54, any idea how many are left? There are nine left. Uh, the corporation owns two of them. Two are in private hands. The rest are in museums around the country. So people do have an opportunity to still see them. You know, it's already hard to believe at just how amazing F11 is and what it really can do. You know, that multi-surface coating technology, I mean, we're literally doing every square inch, you know. But engines, we can even do engines. And what's really great about engines, you know, obviously they get hot, you know, you get a lot of dirt, debris, so forth that comes in. But the top coat, one, with the easy release non-stick coating characteristics, all that dust and dirt, again, doesn't stick as it normally would. It wipes right off, but there's no heat issues either. You know, you can spray this down into the motor and so forth. You're not, after, not really worrying about the belt squeaking, none of that. You, you will not have those issues with this product. It's as simple as, just like everything, spray it on, okay? Take your first towel and look at this, this buffing in. Look at how it's bringing it right back to its original, like new condition, right? That's what you want. You know, you want to bring this motor back to life, keep it in its like new condition, especially, you know, cars that are exotic as this, right? But look at those results. More importantly, watch this. Again, it doesn't matter if it's the plastic, the metal, any part of this motor you can use with Topcoat F11, even this seal, right? You want to keep that seal supple, keep the rocks off of it, and, and make sure that it stays in, in its original condition, Topcoat F11 hands down. Look at these results. And I'm just spraying it and buffing it in. Imagine if I put a little time to this, what I could do with this motor. And then of course, moving up here, you can already see all the throw up from the tire, right? The carbon fiber, that beautiful carbon fiber. But again, the top cut F11, if you have top cut F11 on that surface, you will not get that buildup. And if you get slight buildup, it wipes right off. So again, all I do, I'm just gonna mist it. I'm even gonna hit the carbon fiber and watch this again. Just a simple buff. So, you know, you can really see what, a, what an incredible difference the Top Coat F11 really does make. So, if you want to learn more, you can always go to our website at topcoat.tv. This is a 1973 Mose Safari Car Metal Top Convertible by Mose Seaplane. Got all that? Yeah, a guy by the name of Bruce Baldwin Mose built airplanes, decided to build an automobile. The most distinctive part of this car is what covers the body. It's an aluminum body with Naga hide vinyl that's been stretched all over it with staples and bubble gum, whatever. There's a lot more to this automobile than we have time to get into, but it just reminds me to remind you to drink responsibly. There's still more to come on Top Coat's magnificent machines after this break. Welcome back to Top Coat's Magnificent Machines coming to you from the Concord Delegates of America in Plymouth, Michigan. This is a high-end half dozen. Look at these Cadillacs from the 1930s owned by John Grendike. These cars, as the saying goes, look better than they looked new. 
and there's a 1957 Cadillac here that is stopping people dead in their tracks. Now back in 1957, Harley Earl and his team of designers at General Motors just blew the lid off the automotive design world with the 1957 Cadillac Eldorado Baritz. This one owned by Paul Friskoff. And what can you say except, oh, wow, whenever someone sees this car? <laughs> well, I just love the lines of it. I think it's one of the most gracious looking cars of, of any of the Cadillacs. What do you think about this design? Well, I, I think it kind of stands out from the other designs in that, it, first of all, it has a single taillight, so it's very recognizable from a distance. And there was such a huge difference in the design between the 56 and the 57. They really advanced the styling a lot. And it has an electric latch mechanism in the trunk, which was way ahead of its time. Yeah, that's true. You just kind of gently shut the lid, and it draws it down to the proper level. And uh, this particular one has an anodized front grille and it has a drum clock, which is unusual, and uh, the, the factory air, and then just, you know, full power for a 57. It was just kind of amazing. I am standing between Barton and Cindy Close, the owners of this fabulous 1953 Buick Skylark, the 50th anniversary car. Obviously, uh, it's a very special car in Buick history, but 1953 especially is what sets this one apart. Absolutely, and for us, it was because it's the 50th anniversary from when my great-grandfather worked at Buick, but Harley Earl designed this car specifically for the anniversary. Much lower, uh, has Kelsey Hayes wheels, uh, the windshield is cut down, so it was all new. The first V8 for Buick is in this car. So they made about 1,600 of these cars, and the only choice you had was color. They were $5,000, and they were exactly alike other than the color. What's the restoration history on this Buick? So this car is very original. Um, we decided to do a frame-off restoration rotisserie about three years ago, so it is just finished. I bet you haven't seen one of these before. This is a stainless steel body 1960 Ford Thunderbird. Only two of these were built. There's this one here, and the other one still resides with Allegheny Ludlam Steel. But the major question is, did John DeLorean see this before he started building cars? Well, back in the 1950s, America was just learning what a sports car was. The 1953 Corvette, the 55 Thunderbird, but this 1950 Muntz Jet hardtop convertible beat both of those cars to the punch. It's owned by Dave Hands. This is a pretty early car in the production, isn't it? This is serial number 102, which is the second one made out of a total production of 198. And you changed the color of the car, why? Well, the color of the car, the way I found it, there was hardly any paint, so I didn't know. One of the colors advertised as being an option for the Munz jet was uh, Tahitian red, and so this is our interpretation of what Tahitian red might have been. The model designation is hardtop convertible, so I assume the top comes off. It does, with persuasion. It was made out of angle iron and chicken wire. I think it will take two very enthusiastic, large people to remove the top. We'll be right back with more on Top Coat's Magnificent Machines. Top Coat's Magnificent Machines is brought to you by Magic Creeper, the most versatile creeper ever. Custom Auto Sound, the originator of classic car OEM fit radio since 1977. And by Top Coat, the best coatings in the world. Welcome back to Top Coat's Magnificent Machines coming to you from the Concord Delegates of America in Plymouth, Michigan. And uh, we've showed you some pretty high-end blue chip classics so far on the show, but now this is what heaven really looks like to a drag racing guy like me. I'm with David Gutierrez. He's on the car selection committee for the race car classes. And uh, this is really heaven for anybody who loves drag racing, Dave. Yes, it is. We actually set up this class to pay homage to the uh the uh, legends of drag racing. These were the original monsters of the Midway back in 65, 66, 67, long before the funny cars came about. This was it, the people came to see these cars. 
Well, this is probably impossible for you to answer, but do you have a particular favorite of all these? Well, I think the one that I saw first probably is a favorite. It was probably Ohio George Montgomery car, which is here courtesy of the uh, Henry Ford Museum. And it's probably one of the most significant vehicles here in terms of seniority, race seniority and accomplishments. Ohio George did it all, and we're really blessed to have his car here. From four-wheel racing to two-wheel racing on this 1925 Henderson motorcycle, one of the largest and fastest motorcycles of its age. 28 horsepower out of a four-cylinder engine, 1,300 cc's, and a motorcycle that began its life as a police motorcycle, and then it was converted to a board racer, and then it raced on the dry lakes in speed runs, and it's still being raced today in vintage events. It looks pretty good for a motorcycle this old. Time now for Top Coat's Top Pick. This 1909 Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, chassis number 1203, features brilliant bodywork thanks to a silver finish, polished aluminum, and nickel plating. But what makes it a real standout is that it was salvaged from a British scrapyard in 1946. Well, we hope you've enjoyed seeing all of the incredible classic cars here at the Concord d'Elegance of America in Plymouth, Michigan. We've shown you cars that represent the first 120 years of the automobile, and maybe this represents the future, the brand new mid-engine C8 Corvette. And someday, we may feature this on a future episode of Top Coat's Magnificent Machines. I'm Bill Stevens. Hope to see you next year.